that even the chair you're sitting on, you had no choice but to sit on it. Because, here's the, just to prove to you why there is a problem. We're taught in the Talmud from the Mishnah, it says, Akal Tzafoy, everything has been foreseen. This, in fact, I believe some of you have seen this scene right now. You've seen it before. We call it deja vu. We call it when sometimes you have a dream and you see something. For example, like we call it a premonition. My daughter, Brochi, a few years ago was expecting a child and back of my mind, if it was a boy, I'd have to go back to London for a Brit Mila. What was she going to have? Da, da, da. And I had a dream. I promise you, I was in my Tel Aviv apartment, dreaming, where my daughter said to me, Daddy, pass me Shani. And I woke up, and I WhatsApped my daughter, Brochi, and I said, um, Broch, are you having a girl? Are you going to call her Shani? This is when she was like eight months pregnant. I promise you, my dear brothers and sisters, I saw Shani, and by the way, her name is Shani, and I saw her, like, that's what she looks like, she's super cute, and her beautiful little mushy face, I saw Shani before her parents saw her. How? I don't know, but I saw the scene, I saw it, I saw it, and I told her even, I WhatsApped it with this WhatsApp proof. How does that work? Meaning, I believe 100%, this scene has been seen. And you were all going to sit in that same. And you were going to cross your legs that way. Meh, not even the other way. That was it, that's in the video. That's in the video. The Talmud says that when someone is born, when someone is born, a butt call comes out. A heavenly voice comes out and said, Nikki, when you were conceived, 40 days after the conception, Nikki said, Nikki's soulmate is... <clears throat> said your name. Said the name. Says in the Talmud that on it's named. So one minute. If that's the case, which I believe one hundred percent, that there's kind of a video in heaven, which has seen this before. In fact, we've all got our own like DVD of our lives, which is it's out there. It's out there. If that's the case, where we're just playing through the DVD, any of you actors or actresses? Any of you? On one hand, in a sense, we're all acting, and act, acting out our lives, acting out our mission, acting out our book, acting out our movie. If that's the case, that Hakol Safoy, if that's the case, that Hashem is all-knowing, does it make sense to say God is all-knowing? I hope so, because Maimonides says it's one of the 13 principles of faith. You can't be a good Jew and not believe he's all-knowing, according to Maimonides. One of the 13 principles of faith. He's omnipotent, omniscient. He sees into the future. You're telling me God can't see it? It's something he can't do. Well, if he can't do it, that's not the God that I know, that we know is Hashem Echad. Hashem Echad, we say this famous line that, by the way, in the Sephardi world, it's like, you know, it's such a difference between an Ashkenazi way of praying and a Sephardi way of praying, you know, for so many reasons, you know? You know, one of the things being in Israel and Tel Aviv as I go to many different synagogues, you know, when the Sephardim say, Hashem Melech, Hashem Melech, Hashem Yimnoch La'alam Ve'ed, it's, like it's like going to the army, it's like everyone is up, and everyone is screaming and shouting, and the Ashkenazi is like, what's going on? But I love it, because those three, those phrases, Hashem Melech, he's the king, Hashem Malach, he was the king. What does that mean, Hashem Malach? I've got news for you. We say, Adonai Lama Hashem Alach. Hashem is the king before the world. We, we, that's the, the phrase for past, present, and future. Hashem Yimlov. We believe God's above past, present, and future. That means it's all happened. It's all knowing. My friends, if it's all knowing, you know, I said to Vanessa when you called me a few, you know, it's like, can I have a chat with you? I said, I think it's already happened anyway. Like, it's in the video. Like, chill. It's, it's done. It's done. If things are done, which I believe 100%, because... I'm an Orthodox Jew who, who believes in Hashem, who believes in God's all-knowing. If that's the case, then how on earth do we have free will? What is the point? The whole thing is just, as the Ishbitzer says, it's just one big game. 
Who are we kidding? If every, are we compelled? Is there fate? The Greeks discussed the concept of fate. We've got a big problem. Because the whole reason why we're here in this world is to choose. It says in the Bible, in Deuteronomy, Hashem says, I put life and death in front of you. Choose life. How can we choose life if you chose life? And it's already decided what you're going to choose. If it's done and dusted, if it's already decided, what is the point? The whole point of the universe, the whole point of why we're here is to become good and choose good. If we can't choose good because everything is inevitable and destined and fated, what is the point? And yet the Mishnah says, Hakol Tzafoy, says Rabbi Akiva. Everything's foreseen. Yet he says, We've got the free will. In other words, there's two philosophical truths. An axiom of truth, so without them we are denying the basic tenets of Judaism. Number one, Hashem has full knowledge. 100%. It's foreknown who you're going to marry, when you're going to marry, the date, the time, that minute. It's a famous story of, of um, these two, there's this marriage and this great tzaddik, the, the base Salevi is under the chuppah. And as the true story, the groom's putting the ring on, on the girl's finger, the ring falls. So like, you know, if you're in a normal room and you'd be like, ooh, if there's a big Kabbalist, you're like, maybe it's a sign. And they picked it up, and, and then the chatan again, okay, let's try again. Can't be that hard. She hasn't got soap on her finger. Try it. They dropped again in front of everybody. And everyone said, maybe she's going to do it. Maybe it's Bashet. You're not meant to get married to her. And then the third time, lucky. He managed to get it on the third time. So everyone surrounds the Kabbalist afterwards and said, do you think it was a sign from Hashem that it shouldn't happen? And the Kabbalist laughed at them and said, Everything in its right time. Meaning in the video, that also happened. And in the video, the marriage had to happen at 2.31. Not 2.30, not 2.29, 2.31. So sometimes when like, the bride's delayed, it's not because she, like, she doesn't know what she's doing. She's waiting for the video when it's actually meant to happen. Everything in the right time. So if that's the case, how do we have free will? What is the point? Like we normally believe, like all of you the normal conventional wisdom, you're going to get tremendously rewarded for coming tonight. Why? Because we're in Tel Aviv. It's a Wednesday night. There's a plethora of other options to do than come and listen to some rabbi. And yet you're fulfilling the mitzvah of Talmud Torah. We taught Talmud Torah connected kulam. So ostensibly, you're going to get hugely rewarded. So right now, for those of you who are staying, Right, every minute that you sit down on that chair, you'll get a, probably to call it another million dollars in your spiritual bank account. So hopefully if you manage to stay for the 50 minutes, there's going to be 50 million dollars up there. The question is, why is the 50 million dollars if you didn't have a choice? If you were always going to come? If it was inevitable? Right, if it was inevitable. Melanie here? Right, if it was inevitable, then who are we kidding? Why should you get rewarded for something that you had to do? Everyone's hearing the question. Do I have free will to drop this cup? What do you think? Do I have free will? Yes. Was it in the video that I went like that? It was in the video. So if it was in the video, what can I do? I'm just playing out fate. It was fate. I need to help. So therefore, that's the question, my friends. How do you have free will if there's foreknowledge? Everyone's got the question? Everyone understands the question? Yeah, everyone with me on the question? You're feeling the question? How can... Let me ask you a question. Give me an experience. Vanessa, give me an experience of something that you thought you chose. You was a dilemma, you could have gone left, you could have gone right, and you made a choice. Did you have a, a was it a dilemma? Were you like, should I, should I not? I wanted to, but yeah, I ran into my life, and then where I was going to work, stuff to do. So do you believe you chose to come? Yeah. Or do you believe Israel chose you to be here? So how do you coexist that you chose? Do you also believe that Hashem knew you'd be here? I think that 
think, I think if I feel that my heart is here, that I feel I have to be here, and that, yeah, there's something in me that... What I'm saying is, did you choose to come? <clears throat> or did it have to happen? Take the action to come. I do did you have an option? Was there any alternatives? Not if it was inevitable. And something we're going to speak about in Jewish, in, in secular philosophy, they'll talk about fr free will from the perspective of if there are only, you only have free will if there's alternatives. If you have lots of alternatives and you're choosing instead of A, B or C, then you, but if you have no other alternative and you have to go down that road, ostensibly at that point you don't have free will. We're going to come and counter that soon. But that's the question. There's two philosophical dictums, two truths. On one hand, I called Safoy. Everything is foreseen. God is, on the other hand, we have free will. How do we work? So I'm going to give you tonight seven explanations for those who can stay with me. Classic Jewish Kabbalistic explanations of that. The last part to the blow your mind stuff, which is trippy, which I'm going to need us to do a bit of, if we're happy to do a bit of meditation for that because it's beyond this world. The last explanations, which is the ones I'm, I've been like trying to grapple with because they're beyond paradoxes. So let's start with the easy first and, and, we'll, and we'll build up, okay? But I'll start with a story. There's a story of the Baba Sali. Baba Sali, and I want to say this because Elo Nishmas, he is his yacht site last week, and a lot of people went to Nitivot, and there were thousands and thousands of people there. And, He's one of my tzaddikim that I feel super connected to. So I wanted to say a story, Le'ilo Nishmat Baba Sali, because when you say a story in the, in the memory of the Kabbalists, he then prays for us and opens up gates. And, and let's take at this point to say that the Torah we're learning tonight should be in the merits of Am Yisrael, it should be in the merit of the hostages who are still there. Hashem should release them. Mamash enough now, they should be released. It should be retrospectively in the video that they were released tonight. And that should be released tonight. Hashem should protect all chayalei tzvag and al Israel. We should be protected right now. As we're going in and out of danger, Hashem should protect us. We should see miracles. And the whole of Am Yisrael, the whole of Eretz Yisrael should only, only have shmirah b'zat Hashem. Amen. So, Baba Sali's story goes like this. A few years ago, and I'm from London. It was like a London Baba Sali story. Baba Sali is the tzaddik in the Tivat. A family from London came to him saying, Rabbi, you've got to help me. My son has run away from home. We think he's been taken. We don't know where he is. The police can't help. No, one's, no one knows where he is. We don't know how to find him. What do we do? Can we get a blessing to find him? This is what the Baba Sali did. He took out a piece of paper, took a pen, closed his eyes, and started drawing a map of central London. He's never been to London. He draws this map of central London, has a building, puts a big X on the building and goes like that, he's over there. True story. They call up the police in London and say, can we just check this place, everybody? The police went to the building and found him there. True story. How did that happen? And there's many, many stories of the Baba Sali like that. It's because he accessed the frame. He accessed the video frame. He went into the video frame of, of truth, of of reality, and he could access, in a sense, what Hashem accesses, and therefore, if God accesses what I saw, did my, did my daughter have a choice to call her daughter Shani if I saw that she called her Shani before she was born? Ostensibly, no. And if so, what's the point? This whole thing is one masquerade. None of us have choice, and if none of us have choice, what is the point? Look, you understand the question. Here we go. Answer number one from the Rambam. Maimonides answers. It's in the Laws of Tshuva. It's a classic Maimonides rational answer in which he says in the Laws of Tshuva the following. Don't even bother trying to understand it, says the Rambam. The Rambam says this is too complex for the human brain. It's too complex for the human mind. Why? Because we can maybe, you know, we have a biologist here who's, who's studying science you've never studied, and it's impossible to study the science of God, because God's above this world. God is not constrained by time and space. God is infinite. The finite can't study under a microscope the infinite. We can study the finite, we can't study the infinite. So since Hashem 
is above time and space. You see, the question sits on the, on the premise of past, of, of within this world, if it's all happened, then we're not choosing it. But that's how we as human beings trapped in this matrix can figure things out. If you step back, where God is definitely can step back prior to the world, prior to time. Have you ever thought, what's it like in heaven? You know, when my dad, my dad passed away, I'm thinking, you know, what time is it up there? There is no time in Shemaim, ostensibly. In other words, they're not connected to our time, ostensibly. In other words, in, in, in the lands of Hashem, there was no past, present, and future. And none of your brains, however clever, and we've got a few very clever people here, because I saw that before, however high your IQ, you're never, ever, ever going to figure out how to experience timelessness. Because we're constrained within time. We are trapped in time. We are trapped. So to understand the question, says the Rambam, who are you kidding? It's impossible. In other words, it's a paradox. Deal with it. They're, two, they're both true. Maimonides says, 100% Hashem has full knowledge and Hashem is all-knowing. Otherwise, he's not God. On the other hand, you have to have free will. Otherwise, what's the point of being here and God promises us and pledges in the Bible that we have free will? How are they reconciled? Go figure. We can't understand in this world. In the next world, you'll understand. Whilst we're trapped. Whilst we're trapped in this world. That's what Maimonides says. Maimonides says. The rivets, one of the opinions says, so opinion number one is impossible to know because to know, you've got to, you've got to know God and God's beyond time and space. Our brain cannot comprehend. You know, there's this great philosopher said to me once, we can know what Hashem does. We, can't, we cannot know who Hashem is. We can't know what God is. Eifshah. And to understand the answer to this question, you've got to know God. And you can't know God, so... Forget about it. The great Rivet says, Maimonides, so why would you ask the question then? He got very angry with Maimonides. He said, how dare you create the question and then tell everybody it's impossible to know. You're creating doubts and, and problems in the Jewish people. And then the Rivet's got his own answer. I'm not going to answer now because, by the way, there's hundreds of answers to this question. And I've picked out seven of my favorites. So number one, you have to give you Maimonides because it's the most famous. It's, it's legendary where he asked the question. He says we can't know. Let's move on. Number two. Oh, easy one. And I think so simple and so classic. And maybe you'll tell me what the floor, floor of this is, because each argument has its floor. And it's from a great study called the Sadia Gon. One of the reasons why I'm a believing Orthodox Jew is because I studied the history of Judaism. And in this room, there's every chain of our generation, there's no missing link in the timeline. So when the Bible's finished, the Old Testament's finished, the next, the Tanakh takes over. Moses died, Joshua takes over. Then Isaiah, then Samuel, then King David, then King Solomon. Then you have what's called the, the book of the scribes, Tanakh, Nevi'im Ketuvim. That takes you to the second temple time, Ezra, Nehemiah. What people don't realize is when that stops, we continue writing, which is the Mishnah, where you have the area called the Tanaim, Akiva. Hillel, Shammai, when they die, the next period takes over and writes. So they're called the Amoraim, Rab, Rav Ashi. And when they die, the next period comes in called the Go'onim. And that's Rav Sajir Go'on. He was one of the Go'onim. So we're talking about about one and a half thousand years ago. And he says the following answer to this famous question. Before Maimonides. Maimonides died about 830 years ago. So he says the following answer. Listen to this. Says Rav Sajir Go'on, it's easy. Why is everyone so bothered about it? The question is because you have convinced yourself that your, the fact that you, Hashem knows about it causes you to act. So again, once again, what am I going to do? Rabbi Hill, don't do it again. Don't do it again. I did it again. So you could have argued that ain't no choice. It's in the video. I, I, what can I do? Hashem made me. Listen to the genius of Sadia Gon. You ready for this? It's easy. He says, chill out. It's not that God knew, therefore I did. It's that I did, therefore God knew. It's our free will, says Rav Sadia Gon, causes the foreknowledge. It's not that the foreknowledge causes the free will. 
because Hashem is above time and space, so Hashem is able to kind of stand back. And that's why it says this word safoy, which means like, you know, one thing I love, one of my, even now as a, uh, my hobby, is to spectate my football team Spurs. You know, so I was just now in London a couple of weeks ago. I went and as a spectator, I'm spectating Tottenham playing. Just because I can see what's happening, and sometimes I can see the goal before they score it, because I can say, oh my gosh, we've done that same mistake again. They're going to score, they're going to score. They scored. It's not the other team, and we end up crying. Doesn't mean I'm God. Doesn't mean I'm influencing. A spectator can see. Has any of you ever stood on a very, very tall building, and you could see a accident before it happens? Any of you ever seen that? I've done that. It's a big building in London. Cute, beautiful hotel. Shard. You can see the whole of London, crazy. And you can see accidents before they happen. You can see, bang. And you're like, they're gonna crash, they're gonna crash, they're gonna crash. Crash. The fact that I saw it doesn't mean I'm influencing them, no. You can see something without influencing. Says your study are gone. The answer number two is, what's the problem? It's the free will causes us share. Meaning, yes, there's this video. But who writes the video? You guys. You chose to come tonight. For sure, you chose. That's why, because anytime there's something spiritual, I'm going to say this over and over again tonight. Akol bidei shamayim chutz miyirat shamayim, says the Talmud. Hashem, how much you earn, that's nothing to do with you, actually. That is Hashem. How healthy you are, that's nothing to do. That's, that's up to Hashem. How your IQ, we've got a few doctors in the room with very big IQ. Got news for you. You're not going to get rewarded for your IQ, guys. Sorry. Do you know why you needed your IQ? Because, you, because Hashem wanted you to be doctors. You need to do to have a good IQ. So he puts a good IQ in you so you can do your mission. So you shouldn't be like, oh, I'm so clever. It's so silly when people are arrogant because of the gift they get. Hakobi de Shemaim. Chutz, Yirat Shemaim. Your moral choices, your ethical choices. How nice, how compassionate. If you lose your temper or not, that's you. If you chose to come and get involved in something spiritual tonight, that's you. If you're kind to your parents or not, that's you. If you're nice to your flatmate, where's the flatmates? Where, where are the roommates? Oh, my two roommates here. When you're nice to each other, and when, when, when you like clean each other's side of the room, that's you. When you leave it messy, that's you. In other words, your area of your moral and ethical zone is you. I, it's known. Of course it's known, because your Hashem knows what you choose. You with me, Raquel? You understand the answer? That you're choosing it. And that's why Hashem knows. It's not that Hashem knows and therefore you have to choose. He explains our choices cause Hashem's knowledge. Melanie, you understand the answer? You good? Everyone happy with that answer? Anyone see a flaw in the argument? I have a question. Uh, what is this? Sorry? So if God uh, that negates the effects of God, like he, so he knows everything, but he's not the one who's influencing. He can influence, but he's not the one who's concluding it. He's not the one who's doing it. We're doing it. We're choosing it. And, and Hashem's setting up the background. He's like the, we're like the puppets, but we have space to choose. You know, our DNA, our... IQ or good looks or not is part of the gifts from Hashem. What we do with it is up to us. That's the second answer. I think, that, I mean, the downside obviously is if you really, really, really understand the fact that it's known about, it's too trippy. Like, if it's really known about it, don't give me that you really got choice. If it had to happen, in other words, there's still a bit of a paradox in there. But to be honest, Rosh Hashanah Yukon's a beautiful answer. That's answer number two. Let's go. Number three. Here we go. Let's start with some classics now. So the Ral Bag is one of the famous classic answers on this. If anyone has done some research in that, you're looking in, if you go on Google and say, you know, free will, Jewish opinions, the Ral Bag comes out because the Ral Bag was a big radical. Who was the Ral Bag? He was born in 1288 in France, died 1344 and came up with a very radical perspective, which initially when I read it, I was like, <gasps> heretic. And people like the Rivash called him a heretic. And they said, how can you be a rabbi if you don't believe in this? But the older I get, 
And as I said, you will see from the end tonight, I'm kind of leaning more in that direction now. Here we go. Not in the direction of being heretical, that it wasn't heretical, and actually it's very beautiful and very deep. But it, initially, it's shocking. Because again, initially when you become, as a rabbi, allergic to, to limiting Hashem, you know, to say God is limited, I'll give you a quick, you know, the quick question. Are you ready for this one? Can Hashem create a rock that he can't lift? Yeah, I think so. And the Jewish people, right? He can't destroy them. Can he create a rock that he can't lift? Like, he can't destroy them. Don't give me a metaphor. I'm asking a rock, mate. On a rock. Is there a rock? Don't give me metaphors. A rock. Can Hashem make a rock and now I can't lift it? Or can he create an illness that he can't cure? Yes or no? It's very simple. No. Yes. No. Nikki? He can't do it? So something you can't do? You're limiting Hashem, Nikki? Nor to you no. to limit Hashem's infinite power. But if <coughs> Ruby, what do you say? Can Hashem create an illness that he can't cure? So if he doesn't cure it... I didn't say if he doesn't... Can he create something that then he can't do? No. Like, like the, like the so you're saying there's something he can't do? Infinite. Either way, you've got a problem. No, Either way, you've got a problem. Either way, it's a no. As the philosopher said to me, the problem's in the question. But I'm not going to get there. Or what I'm trying to say to you is we should be allergic to limiting Hashem's power. The whole point of God is He's limitless. He's all-knowing, all-powerful. If that's the case, listen to this Ralbag. Says the Ralbag. Do you know the solution to the problem? The way I'd put it is, let's say we've got two things here. Instead of this is a Coke bottle tonight, we're going to call it free will. Because trust me, for, my, for me it's a lot of free will. Or not. Right? It's my challenge. So you've got the Coke bottle here, and this we'll call the water of tr- truth and Torah. This is the metaphor for God, right? This is the foreknowledge. So over here, you've got foreknowledge, you've got free will. How do they coexist at the same time? Says the Raul Bag, this foreknowledge isn't as strong as you think it is. Do you know what it is? It's a bit limited. Let me explain. Guys, shh, shh. he explains the following. He brings a case. It's a famous verse in Genesis. Abraham. What's the biggest challenge God asked Abraham to do? Anyone know? Sacrifice his son. Indeed, Melanie. Sacrifice his son. Do you know what Hashem says after he sacrificed his son? Do you know what God says in the Bible? What does he say? He says, Ato yodati. Ato means now. Yodati, I know. Ki yareya do you fear me? Like, psh. He gave him a psh. You ever done the psh? Hashem gave Abraham a psh. That was pretty impressive, Abraham, Hashem said. Now I know. Now I know? Says the Raul Bag. So prior to that, he didn't know. Is there something that God didn't know? Who are we kidding? He saw the video. What do you mean, now I know? He's already known. Listen to this. This is trippy. Says the Raul Bag. Because if he would have known, then he, we wouldn't have free will. So what Hashem does, says the Ralbag, he limits his knowledge. He withholds his knowledge. I'll give you an example. Who in here has got Netflix? Probably lots of you. What is something on Netflix that you want to watch you haven't watched yet? Give me. Manifest. Huh? Manifest. Manifest. So let me ask you, it's not worth it. No, but, but here's the thing. Finish off the analogy now. God's got one big Netflix system. There's just some videos he hasn't watched yet. He waits to watch it in real time. He waits for events to happen. It's, it is there. He has access to it because he's God. But says the Raul Bag, if he would watch the video, it has to happen. So he doesn't watch the video. So he withholds himself from watching the video. By the way, the whole video analogy is a really interesting analogy because I think we can start realizing all of you have got Netflix, but just because you've got Netflix doesn't mean you've watched every single thing. So similarly, Hashem can have lots of videos of all our lives, but it doesn't mean he's watched it. And it doesn't, the concept is it seems that when he watches it, when he knows, things have to become inevitable. 
Says the Ralbag, Hashem therefore holds off on watching till present time. And therefore now I know. So Hashem is saying, now I know that you're sitting on these chairs and coming tonight. Till now he didn't watch your video. Because if he watches the video beforehand, it's a kind of cheating. And then in a way you wouldn't have free will. So to give you free will, says the Ralbag, he withdraws. You all hear that? It's a bit of a problem, but if you understand from the Arizals, later on we're going to get the Kabbalistic and, and in Kabbalah, how did Hashem make the world? It's the same thing, you know? I think about this a lot, you know? October the 7th. How can there be an October the 7th? How can there be a Holocaust? How can there be evil when God is good and God's everywhere? Does that mean God's evil? God forbid. So how does that work, Nikki? How does that work? How, how, how is God good? How is God good? And, and, and yet there's space for an October the 7th. The answer is, there's something called Tzimtzum. Hashem, how we are here, according to Kabbalah, is Hashem went like this. He, he, he contracted. He created a space where ostensibly we can exist and gives, it's a bit like my kids, you know, I've got four beautiful kids. Some parents, I think, make a tragic mistake in suffocating them, holding their hands, trying to like control them as they grow older. Big mistake as a parent. For me, real love is what Hashem does. Real love is, is to give your child the space to become themselves. To express their own individuality. And what I did, especially after my, pe- my children's weddings, I, me and my wife literally went like this. Step back. And we're there for them whenever they need us. We don't interfere. And we cool when we're cooled. And that's what Hashem does. Hashem You want Hashem? He comes and helps you. Otherwise, He gives you the space to make your own choices. And if God forbid someone wants to do the worst thing possible, like on October the 7th, Gewalt, that's a consequence of Tzimtzum. That's a consequence of the contraction of, the inf- of infinity. To create space for a finitism. So what we're going to say is the Rabag is continuing that concept and saying as a result of Simpson Hashem, part of that is this kind of staying back and not watching the video. By the way, as a big football supporter, sometimes after Shabbat, it's one of the really, if you're into a sport, once the result's there, there's no point watching the game. The whole excitement of the game is you don't know the score, you don't know the score, you don't know the score, you don't know the score. So every Shabbat, I think of this whole foreknowledge providence thing, because normally the game's played over Shabbat. I'm like on my WhatsApp, no one, no one tell me the score, please, no one tell me the score. And then I'm pressing like play on, 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 on the video to watch him, like, I don't want to see the score. And I think it's a little bit like that. It's almost like if Hashem sees the score, it's too late. So Hashem like withdraws from seeing the score to allow us to play it out. That's the raw bug. The other is, so over here, the Rabbi's saying there's a problem. Free will, sorry, foreknowledge is a little bit limited. Refreskas is the one that we were speaking about before, is the de- determinist concept, where he says, actually, there's a limitation in free will. And let me explain. So Refreskas was a guy from Barcelona. So the Rabbi's from France. Refreskas is in Barcelona. 1340, he was born. And he gave a radically counter opinion, which is the following. As many of you know who have studied philosophy or science, there's a big, strong feeling about determinism. There's a strong feeling that our genetics and our evolution leads us to almost inevitably go down certain roads. There's no doubt our nature and our nurture play a huge impact into who we are and what we do. And Riff Kreskas wants to say that Absolutely, we kind of, our free will is so, so, so limited. Most of our, he, he, this is what he says. I can't even say it because I feel that again, it's a bit heretical, but he almost says, this is what he says, sorry, I can say it. I'm not saying it's me, actually, I'm just him. He says, you don't have free will, apart from one area, mindset, happiness. Happiness is down to you. It's all going to happen. The question is, are you going to do it smiling or are you going to do it frowning? Are you going to do it and say every day with gratitude, thank you for this? Or are you, are, you, are you going to be bitter and twisted and crying and negative? That's what he says. He says what happens, happens. But what Hashem doesn't interfere with is mindset. 
Personally, I find this too radical. The Torah surely contradicts that by saying we have 613 mitzvot, not just one mitzvah. It's either the mitzvah to be happy, but that's just one of the 613. Why you would say that, in a sense, everything's inevitable, I think is a bit of an issue. And I don't like that opinion. That's just me. Number four. So let's just repay. Number one. Who knew, remember what number one was? Yes. And who's that opinion by? Maimonides, the Rambam. Tiberius. Next time you go to Tiberius, go and say hi. Right, you want to say hi to you. So the Rambam. Maimonides is opinion number one. We haven't got a clue. Number two, who's opinion number two? Rav Sadia Gaon, who said what? Come on, let's go. Who's awake? What did he say? Come on, I'm, I'm going to walk out. No one remembers opinion number two. We haven't even got to the complex ones yet. We haven't got a chance. Come on, what's opinion number two? Anita, save me! Because, because, uh, it's causative. Come on, you can finish it off. The person chooses and Hashem... The choice causes the foreknowledge. It's not that the foreknowledge causes the choice. Well done, everybody, for remembering that. Not Okay, so that, that is opinion number two. You've all got to stay for an extra hour, okay? That's the opinion. You have to watch the video three times. That is opinion number two. And opinion number three, we said, was the Ral bug. What was the Ral bug? Indeed, Melanie, you've saved everyone from its attention. Okay, number three. Good, right? Do you everyone got that again? So repeat it again, Melanie, you said it's too fast. Hashem intentionally limits his knowledge because if he sees it, 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 is, it will be. And he doesn't always want everything to be, so he intentionally does not. And what was the proof from the Bible? That after um, Abraham showed his devotion to God, God said, now I know. Now I know. Good. Excellent. Someone was listening. It's worth me speaking. <laughs> Someone's alive in the room with a brain working. Number four. What was the position opinion number four? I just said that, by the way. Yes. It's in that deterministic. Determinism, really. And the only thing you can control, he says, is... Mindset. State of mind. Mindset. Number four. Let's try it one last time. Number one, Raquel. Number one. Don't bother, my monody is impossible to know. Number two. Rasadia <laughs> Gaon. Rasadia Gaon saying. Uh, that, uh, Come on, the causative one. This affects this. Which one affects which one? Don't give me this affects this. Free will. Free For knowledge, it's not the foreknowledge affects it. Causes, causes. Gorem. And number three, opinion number three. Yeah, Raul Bag. Shem limits the, the Melanie, beautiful, eloquent answer. Number four, finally, we said Rav Crescas, a rabbi from Barcelona, Barcelona, was the, the determinism. Okay, Yana, number five, here we go. Trippy, Shla Kadosh, Rabbi Isaiah Horowitz, born in 1565 in Prague. So we're going from France, Barcelona, now into Czechoslovakia, right? And, and the Prague answers the following. Says the Shla. This is mad. I love this. He brings a case from not Genesis, but Exodus. Moses, heard of him? Important guy, Moshe Rabbi. He stands in there when he's out of Pharaoh's palace and he's like really upset about the anti-Semitism going on. Guess what? Nothing's changed much. So he's there and he's upset by the anti-Semitism and he sees the taskmasters and there's one in particular who's brutalizing one of our guys where Hamas got some of their inspiration from, this brutal taskmaster. So Moshe Rabbi does the following, says in the Torah. He looks this way, he looks that way, and then he kills him, and he buries him. Says Rashi, what does it mean he looked this way and that way? Says the Zohar. It's not Medrash, I mean. It's not that he was seeing, was there physically anyone there? Moses was doing the Bobasali video shtick. He was closing his eyes and going into the video and saying, is anyone good going to come out of this guy? Is anyone good? Could anyone do anything decent in society that's going to come out of this guy? Or are they all just a waste of time? And it says he saw they were all a waste of time, so he killed him. So asks all the cars the Shlach Kadosh, one minute. You can't do that. You can't go up to someone in the street, close your eyes, do a Baba Sali. Is anyone good going to come? Oh, I can see no one good. And then you kill him. That's called a murderer. 
And that's called a murderer. And do you know why it's a murderer? Do you know? Because it's literally self-fulfilling prophecy. Do you know why no one's good coming out of him? Because he's dead! Again, he's looking into the future. Is anyone good? No. Do you know why there's no one good? Because you just killed him! Because you just killed him. Of course no one's good. He's now, you know, maggots are eating him. That's all that's going to be with him. No kids are coming out. Who met? Who nigma? Finito! So, how can Moshe Rabbeinu say, hmm, is anyone good going to come out of him? No one good. So I can kill him. That's literally the most ridiculous excuse for murder of all time. Listen to the shlach. This is just gorgeous. And this might start explaining things that happened in your life. My dear friends, the mystics explain that we have many paths we can go down. In fact, specifically there are seven. In fact, the Zohar says you've got seven soulmates. Not that you should marry all of them in one go. Please don't. One's enough. But there are seven potentials based on the seven paths that you're going to go down. There's you at your highest, which is King David, and you saw Bathsheba. There's you at your lowest, which is like your cellmate that you're going to be in prison with. And there's going to be five in the middle. And that's why sometimes you'll meet someone in life and you'll hit it off and there'll be this crazy connection. But then you're going to move away because one of you has moved levels. Maybe it was one of your soulmates, but you've chosen a different path. Says the Shlach Kadosh, Moshe Rabbeinu looked and saw in all alternative realities. What happens if I don't kill him? There are seven possibilities. There's the possibility if I kill him, fine. Of course, he's not going to have kids. But what happens if I don't kill him? Let's watch the video if I don't kill him. Moses watched the video if he didn't kill him. Mayeto. And he saw, waste of time. So he watched the other video, and the other video, and the other video. And he watched all seven, and he's like, there was nothing good in any potential coming out of this joker. Yalla, let's finish him off. Do you see? It says the shlo we see from here. That we don't just have one video, we actually have seven. But there are seven things, and this gets complicated, called rut. There are seven potentials, and only one truth. And Hashem backs out of deciding which one's the truth till you do it. So it's a little bit, a bit like the Ralbag again, but we've just confused the matter saying there's actually seven potentials, seven possibilities, meaning you have a tremendous space and scope for making your decision. That is the Shlach Kadosh. You ready? So how does it answer the question? It answers the question by saying that there's possibilities which Hashem can see, but Hashem chooses not to see the actual choice you make. So there are actually seven possibilities the whole time, says the Shlach. Now let's go a bit more trippy. Says that Arizal. Oh, no, let's do Rukhan of Asman first. We're going to give you eight. Rukhan of Asman says, just let's go into philosophy just for a moment. Something cool. What did you think about this idea about alternatives? Does anyone here agree that if there's no potential alternatives, you don't have free will? Do you agree with that statement? In other words, if, there's no, if you can only go down A, because there is no B, there is no C, there is no D, and you have to go down A, the fact that you go down A, did you choose A? Who agrees with that statement? Who thinks if there's no alternatives possible, you don't have free will? So that's the conventional wisdom. He explains Rabbi Tatz, and he gives a nice parable. Listen to this parable. See what you think about this. Okay, let's get this right. Three men. A, B, C. Alfie, Bertie, and Charlie. Alfie hates Charlie. Alfie doesn't want Charlie to live. He's divided a strategy that Charlie's going to die. Bertie really dislikes Charlie. And he thinks Bertie is going to kill Charlie. But just in case Bertie doesn't kill Charlie, this is what Alfie's done. He's a bit of a scientist, a bit of a scientist like our friend, but much a creepy scientist, not like you. He's a really creepy thing. And he's created a chip, a computer chip, that he's put in Charlie's brain, which if Charlie chooses not to kill him, he's then going to go and kill him. He creates a chip in his brain, which if he activates it, Charlie will go and kill. Sorry, I'll, uh, yeah, Bertie will go and kill Charlie. In other words, a chip in Bertie's brain that Bertie will kill. If he just presses on, Bertie's going to kill Charlie. Nikki, here's the question. You ready for this question? Bertie goes and chooses out of the goodness of his heart to kill 
Charlie. But he was always going to do it because if he chose not to, Hashem was going to make him, like Alfi would have made him do it. So it, it, he had no choice. There was no alternatives. 100% Bertie was going to kill Charlie. The question was how? And then he chose it. Question, does he have free will to do it? So he's, he's not liable. Of course he is. Because he did choose it. Says Rabbi Khan of Asman, we see here that even if things are going to happen, come what may, it still doesn't detract from choice. I think it's brilliant. I think it's genius. Right? In other words, Bertie still is in trouble in heaven. Why? Because he chose it. We're going to learn more about this in two weeks' time, but essentially, the consequence is kind of irrelevant. What's relevant is your choice. And if you choose something, you are liable for your choices, irrespective if it was going to happen or not. You're not being... In- a murderer who kills a victim. You know, I had a friend who was walking around the old city a few years back. A guy from Gold is Green. He was walking around the old city and, a, and an Arab terrorist killed him. And at his funeral, Rabbi Yashif said the following. Let no one think that it's because of the Arab terrorist, he's now dead. Let no one think he was meant to have lived a ripe old age. And because of this, he's now dead. The Kabbalist Rabbi Yoshev, who was one of the greats, said, Jewish understanding is when someone passes, they're always going to pass. Yet, that does not let off the hook, the terrorist. The terrorist is still liable. We believe two things can exist. Something's bashed, something's going to happen, but yet, we're liable for our choices. So it says in the Bible, a murderer gets killed, even if the person who was going to kill, Hashem has decided, they're going to come to the next world. And that's kind of what Rabbi Khan of is saying. So Rabbi Khan of is essentially saying, which is answer number six, that even if you don't have any alternatives, you're still liable. You're still choosing, just like Bertie chose to kill Charlie, even though a thing was in his brain, if he wouldn't have chosen, it would have happened anyway. Number seven, the Arizal. The Arizal's, yeah. It's like the story of Pharaoh, because technically God made his heart more... Beautiful. Beautiful. In fact, Nachmanides says that. Nachmanides used that proof. And he goes, not just Pharaoh, the whole Egyptians. The Bible says, God said to Abraham, you're going to be slaves in Egypt. They were always going to be slaves in Egypt. So why did they get punished? Says Nachmanides. And Nachmanides is similar because they chose it. And even worse, they didn't have to do it with such extremity. And, and, and they still chose it. So even if things are going to happen, we are liable for our choices. Even Pharaoh, who had his heart hardened, he was still liable anyway. Very good. Next, Arizal says, I'm, just, I'm not going to explain this, and we're going to get into the meditation when he finished. It goes like this, and this is where it's going to get trippy. You see, my friends, why am I very much drawn to mysticism? Because I believe in the notion that Hashem is everywhere. The three words, which is fundamental in Kabbalah, en od mil vado, there's nothing else apart from him. Why do we say Shema with our eyes closed and the hand over our eyes? Because you can only really have faith in Hashem when you can't see the world. Because when you've got your eyes open, it's very easy to be distracted. You see more with your eyes closed. Meaning with your eyes closed, you can start accessing that higher world. Says that Arizal in the world, there's four worlds. Four parallel worlds. This is the lowest world called Asiya. Anyone know what the four worlds are? It's called Abiya. The highest one is the world of Atsilut. I'm not going to go through it too much now. Then Bria, then Yitzira, then Asiya. Essentially what he says, when you get close to Hashem in the world of Atzilut, there is no free will, says Daria Kadosh. In truth, real foreknowledge, it's all happening, it will happen, it's done. It's a, it, it, it's a movie that's already been played. But that's in the world of Atzilut. Down here, we're in this paradox where we're playing it out. To go further... The Ishpitzer, and this is what I'm going to finish off, the opinion number eight, the Ishpitzer, which is ridiculously crazy. Essentially what he says. You know, any, any of you like movies? So I've come from a family where my kids like, you know, what's, what's your favorite movie? Uh, Goodfellas. Sorry? Goodfellas. Goodfellas. You like your mafia. So, if it's okay, let's talk about Harry Potter more, right? My, 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 my... <laughs> That's all right. You know, my kids are much more into Harry Potter. They're literally Harry Potter experts. They're world experts. Dina's actually one of the world experts 
in Harry Potter. So when they enter this Harry Potter world, they literally get lost in that world. You get lost in their magical world. Says the Ishbitzer, we're all in our own Harry Potter world. We're all playing in a movie right now. But in truth, it's just the movie. As we say that when Mashiach comes, Hayinu Kachomim, we're going to look back at this world as a dream. You know, one, there was a time in my life I was going through a tremendous trauma and it was Yom Kippur and I was just begging Hashem to help, begging and nothing was happening. And at the end of Yom Kippur, when the chauffeur blew, I literally had what I call an out-of-body experience. I can't explain anything different. Where Hashem just transported me to a place where Avi Hill was down there and the issues were not relevant. It, I, that was just, it's like when you're watching a movie and you get caught up in the movie, you can be sad, you can cry, but then you start the movie, it's like, why was I crying? It's not real. Says the Ishbitzer, in a sense, some of our life is like that. Especially our traumas, especially our pain. Relax, it's, you're within the movie. Things are going to happen, come what may. You know, I'll be honest, I'm from London. And you love me, Paul. And you love me, Tel Aviv. I'm, I'm, I've been lived all my life in London. And I've got the four most beautiful children that I love more than anything. And they've got seven, I've got, thank God me and my wife, seven beautiful grandchildren. What the heck are we doing in Israel? During a walk. My kids are there, my house is there. Our car's there. You know, my kid, you know, Rachele just passed the driving test. I wasn't there to give her a hug today. Every day they're showing us WhatsApp videos of, a, of, of the baby growing up. We had a beautiful baby born a month ago and, and I can't hug him. And I'm, I'm like, what am I doing? But you know why I'm here? Because I 100% believe Hashem has taken me on the chessboard of life. We're all on this chessboard and put me here. And I've got news for you. All of you are exactly where you're meant to be. You're, Hashem's playing chess with you. You're the pieces. And Hashem's moving you around the world. In Tel Aviv, it's this place of Olim are coming and going and coming and going. And Raquel, I'll talk to over the 7th, you came and then you went and then you're back. And do you know what? It's because we all need to be in different places at different times. With different missions, bringing light at different places. And I've got my friends in Italy there. Italy, because you need to be in Italy. And says the Ishbit, so the more we can just let go. Now watch this, Anita. Anita does some coaching. Next time you do some coaching, tell your clients, just chill out. Because you can't really affect much of the movie anyway. So relax. Now it doesn't mean we should just stop trying and working because that's the, where you've got your free will. Let me explain. means now listen carefully. Your job, your mission, should you choose to accept it? As was said to Tom Cruise. Your mission, should you accept it, is... Would you let go your anxiety? Would you let go your ego? Would you let go your control? Would you align yourself to the director of the movie and just do what Hashem wants? That's all. To be honest, that's it. Got news for you. Things are going to happen anyway. The question is, are you going to do it from a high place or a low place? Maybe put another way. You're all going to act out your movie. So this is what Anita, everybody, this is Anita Kanetti from Turkey, who's now living in Tel Aviv, one of the trustees of JTRV, which is thank you very much for that. Here's the thing, Anita. Your movie has, according to the Shlach, seven possibilities. But the movie's the movie. The question is, are you going to act it out with the Anita, the highest Anita, the one which is like the super holy, ethical, altruistic? By the way, she's super altruistic, Anita, and she does amazing kindness. Are you doing it from the maximum kindness, Anita? Or there's a lower self, Anita, which obviously I've never seen, but apparently exists. And, and would you, is it going to be that one, or that one, or that one, or that one? That's your free will. Your free will is which of your seven, you're going to play the same movie, probably marry the same person, potentially, probably live in the same house, or apartment, or bedroom, wherever we live in Tel Aviv. It's another shock I got. You know, I've got a beautiful, lovely house in, Israel, in London, with five bedrooms, and a beautiful garden, and then like for the same money, I can have like a shoebox. How it works? Okay. All right. Shoe boxes are nice. I like shoe boxes. And then, but but I don't believe I really have free will to come to Tel Aviv. Mamash. 
Tel Aviv chose me. How's this rabbi from London in Tel Aviv? There's no rabbis in Tel Aviv, especially guys from London, but it's part of my destiny. I believe that. But I can either be in Tel Aviv with a smile on my face, or I can be in Tel Aviv like many people here just complaining every day. Oh, hate the city. I can love the city, hate the city. I can be at my best or be at my worst. Or five in the middle. That's what the Ishmaelites are saying. Kind of chill out. Things probably will be happening anyway because in the world of Atzilut and in this... And he brings finally a, a parable, and I'll end with this, from the, from the Baal Shem Tov. This is really creepy. Listen to this. The Ishmaelites wants to say, even when you do a sin, that's also Hashem's will. I don't want to go into that too much. doesn't mean you should go and sin what you want and... And, and use the brothel in the building, please don't, right? But, but it just means that when we do sin, you're not surprising God, and, and nothing's a surprise, and, and there's, a, there's a reason and rhyme for everything. So listen to what he says, the Baal Shem Tov says, to, 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 to maximize this analogy, there was a man who wanted to test his wife and see if she'd be faithful to him. So he went on a voyage, disappeared, and dressed up, can you imagine, guys, please don't do this, dressed up as a sea captain, dressed up in the white with the captain, I don't know why she didn't recognize him, but apparently he looked very, very different, dyed his hair, put on a fake beard, and started chatting her up. So he starts chatting his wife up, but now masquerading as the sea captain, and she's like, I'm married, I'm married, I'm married. But he starts really flirting, and he starts seducing her, and before they knew it, he slept with her. And she didn't realize it was the husband. And a few days later, she comes back to the husband and says, Look, I can't even sleep at night. I have to tell you I had an affair. And the husband looks at her and said, No, you didn't. He was with me. Says the Baal Shem Tov. Everything's Hashem. Everything's Hashem. And therefore, the things, just let go of the pain. Let go of the you can't change ripple effects. The effects will be happening anyway. Relax. As we said, what you can control is your smile. What you can control is your morality. What you can control is, are you going to play the part with a smile on your face and with faith and with joy, or are you going to play the part in a very unethical way? Either way, you're playing the part. So kind of relax, let go. And just to show you how this can be true, let's just finish off with this. Everyone, close your eyes a minute. Let's close your eyes then. Let's relax. Close your eyes. That's been it. Brutal couple of months, so let's just relax, everybody. Everyone just relax. Everyone just super relax. Close your eyes. Let's do some breathing. Everyone breathe in. Everyone breathe in. And then breathe out. Just relax. Everyone just chill now. We're like, kind of just go to sleep. Breathe in. Clear your mind. Now just think of nothing. Just nothing in your mind. Just let's really meditate. Breathe in. And then breathe out. Relax. Again, breathe in. Quieten down everything. Silence your body. Silence your mind. Breathe in again. And then breathe out. Just start really relaxing. Feeling super relaxed. Especially on those yummy chairs. Just feel like you're a stone relaxing on the, the ground, the sand on the shore. Breathe in again, breathe in. And then breathe out. I'm relaxed. I'm relaxed. And again, breathe in. And then breathe out. Clear your mind. Let's start. Your right foot, let it go. Relax. Your left foot, relax. Your legs, relax. Your back relax. Just feel nice energy, nice relaxation. Breathe in. And then breathe out. I want you to start now imagining going up Jacob's ladder. And as you go up this ladder, you're getting, getting out of the world. You're getting out of this matrix. You're going into this higher space of this world of Hashem, this world of light. All Hashem is is light. Light, light, light and love. Light and love. You're kind of going into that space where all there is is light. You're leaving your life behind. You're leaving your movie behind. It kind of is a dream. It's an illusion. The only thing which is genuinely real is God. It's you and Hashem. But it's your soul in Hashem. It's not your identity in Hashem. It's your soul in Hashem. It's your essence in Hashem. It's your neshama and ruach and nefesh in Hashem. That's all there is. 
That relationship is a kind of a, it's, it's a dream. That stress at work isn't even a dream. It's just, it's ridiculous. It's not true. It's like the movie, which is never true. Only thing is true is this beautiful light and this beautiful love. Start trying to feel that love. Feel that light. Everything else is left behind. And in that space, can you feel in that space? All there is is this oneness and unity and light. And that's how the Ishbitzer can say that in, in the, that's real reality. When we leave this world, we'll see what was real. And the only thing which is real is those moments of spiritual connection. That's it. The other stuff was just the dressing. It was just the, back, the background. And open your eyes and just now come back to your world. And in your world, never forget there's a higher experience and a higher reality and a truer reality. And one of the ways maybe to cope with the tragedy of this world is to know, thank God, it's only short term. And there'll be a time when the movie stops and then the real experience will start. You know, one of the beauties of Mashiach and it's going to come very soon. We're going to live in a world where everyone's going to be on the higher consciousness. Where there'll only be love. Where there'll only be unity. Where there'll only be oneness. There won't have to be tragedy anymore. There won't be tragedy. It'll be the last thing. And please God, in merit of the Torah we've learned tonight, in merit of all your amazing volunteering you're constantly doing, in merit of the Chayalei Tzvah and Yisrael, they're all risking their lives for Am Yisrael. Hashem should have mercy. End this part of the film and start the new phase of the Geula of the redemption very, very soon. I'm here of you. Amen. Amen. Dan, any questions? Happy to take a question. So you are free now or not to go and get a drink. Now, one of the things, again, we're doing a big Friday night dinner this week. It's super chilled. I'm, I'm speaking to the caterer tomorrow, tomorrow morning. I'd love you all to come and I can get as much chicken and meat and fish if you want. So just let me know over the next 24 hours if you'd like to come, and then we'll give you a banquet that you deserve on Friday night. Tomorrow night, we're doing another event here as well. For those who are interested in the weekly partial, which is Melanie's favorite thing, you can have me tomorrow, Mel. So maybe I can video it for you. It's going to be the partial bod. There's actually hafashat chala, and I've got one of my friends. We're going to start playing on Thursday night. We're going to have the bar open and music going. So I'm going to be getting lots of whiskey and vodka and cocktails for tomorrow. And there'll be live music that you're all invited to. And then Friday night, there'll be a big dinner. So thank you all for coming. Next week, please, all of you come and bring all your friends to a rock star. My master called Nissan Black, who's super famous. Hashem Melech, Hashem Malach, that song. He's going to be singing with his other crazy songs, which I saw one of them got five million hits on YouTube. So he's going to be in the room, back down there. Nissan over there, in this room, jamming in front of all of you next Wednesday night, so please all come and bring all your friends. I want to get as many people in this place as possible. So, yalla. Erev tov, everybody. Thank you. Good night.